can see through the lights, it's a sign that says restricted area. This is Area 51 in Nevada. It's a super secret facility that uh, you're not allowed to take photographs. You're certainly not uh, allowed to, to enter. But from space, it's perfectly visible from satellite imagery. One of the things that you should keep in mind as you see these images is that they are not of the quality that is feasible, that's possible with this technology. Uh, you can burrow in and get much closer than the image that you're seeing now. Among the transformations that we've seen since these satellites have become available since September of 1999 when operational, the first one in January of 2000, is, is that it's empowered, it's transformed civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, to do the kinds of things that previously were done only by government spy agencies, for good or bad. It's an open question as to whether this is a good development, but certainly it's a transformative development. If you were to look at the bottom of the slide, you'd see that, first of all, what you have an image of is the, uh, one of the Iranian uh, nuclear fuel processing facilities. And at the bottom, you can see that this particular annotated slide was produced by the Institute for Science and International Security from a satellite image from Digital Globe, one of the commercial remote sensing satellite imaging companies. So what you see represented here is a sort of intelligence analysis that previously would have been done by governments. In this instance, it was done by a non-governmental organization using imagery that was acquired from a commercial remote sensing satellite company uh, using imagery that's about one meter resolution. That is to say it's about the size of a grill that you'd find in your backyard. You can discern these kinds of objects from 420 miles in space. Uh, you can do more though than simply acquire static images, images that are just pictures that you can see whether it's of uh, areas in Flint or in Nevada or in Iran. What you see represented here is the same sort of mechanism, a satellite going overhead, but what you're seeing here is a capturing of what's called stereo pairs. If you take a satellite image of the same exact location from two different angles, what you're allowed to do then is produce 3D extractions through specially developed software programs that allow you to, to have the sensation of flying through the city of New York when you have a chance to see that, if you've ever seen a, a, a Google Earth 3D fly through, you have the sensation of flying amongst the buildings. But even more transformative are the things that you can do beyond simply seeing pictures from space. That's, that's an important quality, but it's not the only quality that is offered, the transformative quality. What you see here is a digital map that is presented through its various possible layers. And among the layers that I'm most interested in having us focus on at this point are the vectors. In this instance, vectors have to do with the kind of information that you can provide into a digital map that allows you to identify things. Anything can be identified. They're called vectors. With this particular illustration, what you have are customers, streets, and parcels. This is a representation of a digital map from information that's gathered from space. But you're beginning to see combinations of technologies here that I'll continue to explain. Uh, in this instance, it's customer streets, parcels. It can be anything that is geotagged. That is to say, anything that you think is worthy of being given a set of coordinates and tagged and say, this thing is in this place. Here, it's customers and parcels. But that's only the start of what is possible. A digital map can be used to represent anything as long as you have a, an ability to tag that thing in a spatial relationship, anything. You simply need the tools in hand to take the information from space and fit it into a digital map. The tools that have emerged that are transformative in their nature are cell phones. We have now gone from space to those devices in our pocket. There are, uh, astoundingly, in my view, five billion mobile phones found now around the globe. Uh, the fastest growth rates are found in Asia and Africa. They are transforming the nature of life in these places as well as, as here in North America. But with five billion cell phones, you're beginning to see places that were isolated and disconnected from the larger world become connected. Uh, you can illustrate this graphically by just taking a look at some of these uh, trend lines. The fastest growing trend line is the green one. This is old 
uh, data, which is to say it's over six months old, that show only that there are 4.6 billion, and of course we're now at 5 billion. In the last few years, I have traveled to 20, well, in the last two years, I've traveled to 22 countries, in the last three years, to about 35 countries around the globe, looking at the kinds of transformations that are made possible because of these and other related technologies. What this is a photograph of is a small room, a building in Darjeeling in northern India. It was illuminated only by a generator and a single light bulb, so some of the darkness that you see in the room is a result of the fact that there, there is no real electricity here except for the electricity that's supplied by the generator, a little Honda generator outside. But yet when I asked all of these tea uh, workers, people whose life uh, consists of picking tea, to hold up their mobile phones, everyone in that room was able to hold up a mobile phone. Everyone was connected to their friends and their families and to the services that they need in order to live better lives. This is a, is a way in which these mobile phones are transforming their lives. I've seen the same sort of thing. This is taken in Sikkim. Uh, it used to be an independent ki kingdom of Sikkim until 1975 when it, has a, it, it joined with India, the modern state of India. And what you're able to see here are a group of Tibetan monks who, uh, besides the solar generator seen in the back, are also playing with a mobile phone. Uh, it seems that all of the monks at this particular monastery are also uh, tied in with the larger world. In May, I was either in Tanzania or Kenya. It's, the borders don't have a lot of meaning in this part of, of the world. And this is a community of Maasai people. And again, what is most interesting is, is that what you can see with this particular man is, is besides the traditional Maasai dress uh, where we are in in Kenya, as they say, he also has in his hand a cell phone. Uh, again, the reach is absolutely astounding. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, along in northern Kivu, along Lake Kivu, uh, same sort of thing. What you see here, we've, we're told by iPhone and Stephen Jobs that our iPhone has better reception if we hold it in a particular way. Well, they've discovered that if you just put your cell phone, whatever they make, on a stick and don't touch it, and you get that sweet spot in your location and turn on the speakerphone, you're, you're getting far better reception than what you normally would. And so that's what we're seeing here as well. And just as a side note, the need for transformation in northern Kivu is really very pressing. You may have heard some stories coming out of this part of the Congo recently. As a matter of fact, in Africa, you see a similar sort, even a more exaggerated trend line with the transformation that's taking place. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Africa. Of course, if you're known as Dr. Livingston, you can presume that one would spend a lot of time in Africa, and I've, I've, I've managed to do that. So if you combine these things together, you have digital maps providing data and information combined with the ability to mark your place, to mark, to tag things, whatever you think is important. It's an open question as to what you as a user want to tag. Then you end up with opportunities for growth and security, for transformation. The needs are, Im are immense in the developing world. I'm going to show you some pictures that I've taken uh, recently in Africa. This is Kinshasa, a city of somewhere between 10 and 15 million people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is one of the main streets. The development needs are enormous. Uh, again, the lighting isn't facilitating this, but it's a rather um, heart-stopping moment when you're at the United Nations airport and the only aircraft that you see looking out the window have uh, more to do with the aircraft boneyard than they do any operational aircraft. And the distinction between the operational aircraft and the boneyard aircraft is really quite minimal. Uh, the enormous distances that are involved are also just astounding to be in an aircraft flying over just the Congo for hours and, and one sees nothing but an expanse of jungle that goes on forever. And every once in a while you come upon a community. In the Dem in, again, in Goma, uh, a historical city in the context of humanitarian issues, uh, Goma is a place that has very basic services and needs. That is an active volcano that from time to time inundates the city with, with, with lava. This is in, is in Kenya. Again, the idea, the distances involved. I spent hours in a four-wheel drive, then got on the back of this motorcycle to go hours more to reach that Maasai community that we saw earlier. Uh, and to be with the people that are still living a very traditional life, but yet overlaid that traditional life are these new transformative technologies. 
this is a bonding moment I, I, I had, like many uh, in various places in Africa. And the transformation is literally painted on the walls. You see constantly here the various cell phone companies competing for loyalty, competing for brand recognition. It seems that every available space in many of the villages, the most remote villages in Central Africa, as well as in India, as well as in Malaysia, are painted in the bright colors of various competing cell phone providers. Zane is a major player, as is Tigo. Besides the cell phones, though, there are the traditional mechanisms of communicating, of community building that have the, uh, a tremendously positive effect most often on lives of people living in remote areas. And this has to do with the role of radio. What you're seeing is a very sort of rudimentary radio control booth. That is the, through a window there is the, is a, the announcer. And what's happening with radio and cell phones now is a, is sort of a local area network that's be being created that ties cell phones with radios. People are calling in with program suggestions or with warnings about security risks that are emerging in their villages and their areas. So it ties and binds people together. And what is really fascinating for me as a political scientist is to see how these new technologies are offering opportunities for new kinds of organizations. What I want to do is to share some examples very quickly with you of how new kinds of organizations that only presuppose the existence of cell phones are beginning to emerge all across the world that provide opportunities for people in this instance, people who don't have a bank account, who store their excess wealth in cattle, that, which is vulnerable, for instance, to environmental ish, um, degradation or to disease. Instead, this particular initiative allows people to, I'm holding my clicker up as if it were a cell phone as a prop, but it allows people to store excess value in credits that are based only within a cellular account. They pay for things, they buy things with credits on a cell phone. Uh, Frontline SMS is another example of this where people are using cell phones to monitor elections, to monitor their community, to monitor the availability of pharmaceuticals, send in stock updates as to what they need with mosquito netting, etc. Transforming the ability to develop on their own, they are their own change agents, taking control of their immediate environment and needs through the support of the cellular telephony that's at their hands. The Grameen Foundation is involved in banking, financial services, telling the farmer who's raising uh, a commodity crop what the daily price commodity trading figures are in Chicago, New York, London on his or her crop, empowering them with information to make sure that what they are selling their crop for reflects market value. M-Pesa is an example. This is a photograph taken from Nairobi of how somebody is able to use a cell phone to pay for commodities and services. Most astoundingly, you may have heard of this, Ushahidi and similar uh, um, undertakings where events such as politically motivated violence, other forms of violence are marked, are tagged on a map, uh, sometimes very specific maps with these little geotags that say, that create an, a body of evidence that say, after the election in 2007, for example, in Kenya, politically motivated violence occurred here and here and here. That kind of evidence then in turn is used with the International Criminal Court investigation of, of those incidences. Another example of geotagging using event mapping, it's called, is found with Wadi Kivu uh, in North and South Kivu. This is a program done with Joseph Stiglitz at Columbia University in, in collaboration with other N with NGOs in Africa where the effort is, is to track and monitor events that's affecting people in these very remote and very violent and dangerous areas uh, in Central Africa. Uh, among other things, what they do is they distribute phones to these villages, bring in the two or three people who are the, the key um, holders of phones, train them on their proper use, train them on safety that has to be taken into consideration. If you are in an area that is vulnerable to attack by rebels, you are vulnerable by just simply having a phone. So one of the things that needs to uh, happen is, is you need proper training as to what to do and if you have that responsibility. So these are the kinds of transformative technologies that are changing the lives of people across Africa, across India, and across the developing world. But they are also transformative of us as well. 
we are living in a smaller world today where you can receive a telephone call, send a telephone call, or be in con contact with somebody on Facebook, on Twitter, any other number of technologies with people all around the globe. You can learn today about events because somebody's taking a picture of that event with their cell phone and feeding it on to a news network or feeding it on to Facebook. That means that the demands that are placed on us living in North America, living in Flint, living in Washington, D.C. are greater than ever before. We are in a position of where the world is made small, but at the same time, ever more complex. And what you see here are, are the actual GPS feeds of aircraft over the United Kingdom. The, the rapid change of exchange of ideas is enormous. And at, in the upper quadrant, you see the, a graphic representation of the internet. Just one part of it, one hub of it coming out of the UK. The world is tied together. We are a part of it. Our transformation is to take every possible move that we can to become a part of that, to transform ourselves and be a part of that larger world. I want to thank you very much for your time and attention.